Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I did forget to mention during the um, Joys and Prayer Concerns, thank you for praying for me to get through having my pins taken out, um, but they didn't take them out. They told me no when I went on Monday, so I had to wait one more week. So hopefully they'll take them out on Monday. So if you could just pray a little bit longer, I would really appreciate it. And my husband, too, because he's the one who has to listen to me whine about it. So a few um, weeks ago, I read an article entitled something to the effect of uh, seven ridiculous things I said before I had children. Has anybody seen a list like this before? It was written by a stay-at-home dad who blogs under the name Kezu Dad, if you want to look it up later. And I'm just going to share you his list of the seven ridiculous things he said before he was a parent, and then what he says now, uh, which is kind of opposite. So number seven, my children will eat what I cook. <laughs> now, he says, please eat. I don't care what you eat. We have been sitting at this table for over an hour. If you want hot dogs and Pop-Tarts for every meal, I will give it to you. Just eat. Number two, my children won't be lied to. Now he says, can I play with your iPhone? Phone? No, son, the battery is dead. Sometimes one lie will get me an hour's worth of quiet, and it's worth it, he says. Number five, my children won't eat fast food. Refer back to number seven. My children won't destroy my things. Please, my, the kids break everything they touch, he says. Number three, my children will play outside and TV will be limited. Now, he says, sometimes if the kids are fighting and I turn on the TV, I can get five minutes of quiet, five uninterrupted minutes of quiet, he says in capital letters. Number two, my children will respect and listen to me. Now, he says, the other day I gave a long speech about responsibility and listening. I talked about good behavior and not being naughty. I was talking to the cat. <laughs> and I think I got farther than when I gave the same speech to my children. Number one, my children will keep the house clean. They will pick up after themselves. Now, he just says simply, yeah, I was dumb. Now, obviously, the blog was written with a little bit of exaggeration and hyperbole, but most of us with kids, uh, from your laughter, I can hear that you can relate to that, right? We have this idea of what parenting is supposed to be like, and most of us probably thought or said similar things before we had kids, what kids are supposed to be like, and then once you become a parent, you realize just how far off some of those ideas are. Most people, before they have kids, have all these grand ideas about parenting and then actually become parents, and a lot of that goes right out the window. The Proverbs passage that I just read says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And there is absolutely some truth to this verse. What we teach and model for our children can absolutely affect the decisions they make and the lives they lead. And what we don't teach them and what we don't model for them can absolutely also affect the decisions that they make. But one thing that most parents realize very quickly is that children are not just blank slates to be written on, right? Amen? Did anybody else learn that? They are born with their own personality. They come into the world with their own needs and own unique wants and desires. They are born different and unique right from the very beginning. My mom always tells the story, there's eight of us. My oldest sister, Michelle, uh, turns 35 this year. She'd be probably mad that I told you that. And as Eva told you, my youngest sister turned 15 this week. Uh, and all of us are very different. So my mom, when she had my oldest sister, Michelle, uh, Michelle was a very needy baby. She was very loud. And I was a very quiet baby. I was well behaved. <laughs> and now my mom says, what happened? We were all very, very different. And try as we might to shape our children to give them a good foundation, they do not always make the choices that we would like for them. In 1 Samuel, the story that Nathan read for us today, we have this story of the priest Eli's wayward children. Let me just set it up for you a little bit. Eli is a priest, and he has two sons. And these two sons of his are not exactly on the straight and narrow. In fact, they are very far from it. We're told that his two sons, who also serve as priests, are stealing from the people and from God. Now, when God um, set aside uh, the Levites from all of the tribes of Israel to be priests, they weren't given land. Instead, 
uh, God set up a system in which a portion of the people's offerings to the priest and to God would go to the priest to provide for them since they weren't given land. So once the offerings had been properly offered to God, then a portion of it would go to God to be burned completely, and a portion would go to the priest making the offering to feed him and his family. In this way, the priests were able to provide for themselves and their families through their work. But Eli's sons are not satisfied with the portion set aside for the priest. In scripture, it tells us that they were given the portion after the meat was burned. But Eli's sons wanted to be able to take their pick of the choicest meats, even before the meat had been offered to God. And when people refused to allow them to take the meat before it had been offered to God, Eli's sons would threaten them. They said, if you don't give it to us, we will take it by force. So by taking the meat before it had been offered to God, they were literally stealing that which belonged to God. And by taking the portion of meat that was not intended for them, they were also stealing from the people of God. It's not that different from stories that we read about pastors embezzling money from the church. It's essentially the same thing. The priest, those intended to nurture the relationship between God and the people, actually end up getting in the way of that relationship, doing major damage to it. Now, we didn't read this far into the story, but we are also told that um, Eli's son slept with people they shouldn't have, and in the end, their actions lead to their death. Eli's sons die and are um, taken out of the priesthood. So one of the things that really, I think, hasn't changed all that much between those biblical times and today is the way that society tends to judge an entire family based on one or two individual actions. Eli was judged harshly for the way that his sons behaved. Both then and now, parents are judged often based on their child's behavior. We've all done it, right? If a child is rude or struggles in school or lies or cheats or steals or is just generally annoying, we have a tendency to think that it's just bad parenting. We think things like, if only those parents had disciplined their child better or had better boundaries or given more attention to their child, then the children wouldn't be acting that way. And even when we don't say it, we often think it and act that way. But the truth is that that's not always the case. Things aren't as cut and dry as that because sometimes children, both young and grown, act contrary to the way that their parents raise them. There is no reason to believe that Eli was a negligent parent or a bad priest. Scripture even tells us that he rebuked his sons when he heard what they were doing. He tells them that what they are doing is wrong and that it is an affront to God. But Eli's sons don't listen to him and ultimately it leads to their death. Eli's children make bad choices, but they were their own choices, not Eli's. They did not hold to the values that Eli tried to instill in them. They chose to go their own way, despite the way that Eli had raised them. It's a story that all too many people are familiar with, right? Children disappoint their parents. It's part of life. It's part of growing up. And ultimately, we all have free will. We all make our own choice. Just because your children are struggling or make choices in life you don't approve of doesn't mean that you are a bad parent. God, the best parent of all, the greatest example for us, has the most wayward children. Not even God can guarantee that God's children will make the right choices because all of us, every day, make choices contrary to what God wants for us, contrary to who God wants us to be, contrary to God's values, and contrary to what he teaches us in scripture. But that doesn't mean that we as parents just give up. What it does mean is that we as the church need to be a safe place for parents and children who are struggling. We need to be the place that people feel sharing their struggles and they don't have to worry about being judged but know that they will find help and people to walk with them. Every time a child is baptized in this church or every time new members are received, we as a congregation make vows. We promise to nurture them in Christian faith. Those are the exact words from our um, vows in baptism and in confirmation that we'll say in a few weeks. We promise to live according to the example of Christ and to include these children now before us in our care. We promise to surround them with a community of love and forgiveness and to pray for them. That's part of what it means to live in Christian community together. When parents in our midst are struggling, it is our job as the people of God to walk alongside them, to offer encouragement and support, to share wisdom only when asked, and to be patient as we all strive together to figure out this life and this faith. Because all of us will be there at some point. 
And that's what we promise to do in the promises of baptism. We promise to pray even when things seem hopeless, to love when they are acting unlovable, and to forgive when they mess up. That's what we promise to do as a community of faith. When we do that, the beautiful thing is that we will then grieve with parents when their children make their own choices, choices that are contrary to God's hope and dreams, but we will also get to rejoice together with those times when children make their own choices that live into the future that God and we intend and want for them. I know of one church where a grandmother brings four children with her to worship every Sunday, and each of those four children go and sit with a different family that's not their own biological family during worship. Each of those couples or family help to raise that child during the worship hour. The children get the individual attention that they need, the couple or families get the blessing of knowing and loving that child, and the whole community benefits. I remember when I was little, my parents uh, both sang in the choir, and, um, and when we were in South Carolina, our best friends were the pastor's kids, and their parents obviously were both busy. Their mom sang in the choir, and their dad was up preaching. So um, Amy and Leslie and my um, older sisters and I would sit with um, this one particular grandmother who always had butterscotch candy in her purse. And uh, if we were very good, she would give us a butterscotch candy. Um, But she would also play things like tic-tac-toe with us when she started to see us get bored. Or um, she would help um, read the lines in the hymn so that we could learn to follow along on the music. She taught us the way that we were supposed to behave in church. Not in a mean way, but in a loving and kind way. And that's what I see happening here. It's so beautiful. So one of my favorite things about the church is the way um, that you all help us to parent all of our children. Children, and we're thankful for it, especially on days like today when Dwight gets called into work and somebody has to sit with Eva. So thank you. I think that she's that with the Joneses today. Their favorite thing about Dwight not coming is they get to choose who they sit with. <laughs> it's a very stiff competition, let me tell you. Friends, children, young and grown, don't always make the best choices, but then again, neither do we. As parents, none of us are perfect. But we can be a community that surrounds struggling families with love and compassion, with prayer and hope. We can ask for forgiveness ourselves when we don't always live up to those standards. And together, we can be a better family. As you go about your lives this week, I ask that you take time to look around at the families in your life that are struggling in one way or another. Spend some time thinking and praying about how you as an individual or we as a church can walk alongside them. That is, after all, the kind of community that we pledge to be and that God yearns for us to be together. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.